Thank you, Art, and uh, thank you, Jimmy, for reading and leading us in singing. If you open your Bibles, we're in Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41. And while you're turning there, if I were to ask you the question, what is your biggest fear? Think about that. Don't answer out loud, but uh, think about uh, how you would answer that. Fear is, is universal. All of us, I think, fear various things. So since we have fear sometimes, how do we respond and how should we respond to God's word when he says, don't fear, fear not. One thing I think we need to be honest with ourselves and we need to realize that at various times in our life we do fear things. You, you may be worrying or, or you may fear about uh, your children, whether they're young or whether they're grown or your grandchildren and their future. You may worry about a loved one who is sick and struggling with, uh, with their health. Maybe you're wondering how you're going to continue when um, a family member or, or a friend, somebody close to you has died. Uh, all of us probably can be fearful about our health or our finances and especially what the, the world's been through last year and still in the middle of all this about the pandemic and how that's going to, to work out. We can worry about a lot of things and be fearful about a lot of things. Some things big, some things small. Uh, one thing, the person who is, who is fearful of those things, it's big things to them. And yet God knew that we would struggle with this. So he made sure to write about it often. In the Bible, we find commands and encouragements not to fear. Take courage. Over and over, about 300 times, God says, don't be fearful. He doesn't want us to be consumed by fear. And yet, our fears don't surprise him because we're, we're human. To fear means not to trust God. It means that we're believing whatever the present situation that, that we're going through, the thing that's causing the fear, it's believing that that situation is bigger than God. And God wants us to trust Him and to, and to realize and to trust that He's bigger than whatever the situation is that we may be going through. It is possible to have faith in God and to have fear. You don't doubt that God's able to work, but you are not certain how God's going to work in a certain situation. We might think circumstances that come up in our lives, and uh, I mean, all of us probably, I mean, have you done this? You think about the way that God can handle this, and this is how he's going to handle that. And he can make things better. But the problem is, many times, we're, we're wrong. God's ways, as we're going to learn as we get in chapter 55 of Isaiah, not today, but it tells us that God's ways are higher than our ways. And if we could figure out God, then we'd be God. And so scripture calls us to trust in, in God. He tells us not to be afraid. And he tells us not to be afraid, uh, not because what we're facing is easy, he knows and he tells us over and over that what we're going to face and what we do face in this life is not easy. In this world we will have trials. That's just, a scripture tells us that. And if you've lived very long, you know that by experience. It's a certainty. Look at, uh, I know we're here in 41, flip over to 43, chapter 43. And he says in verse 2 there, when, and I notice it's when, it's not if, it's when, you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they'll not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you'll not be burned. Neither shall the flame uh, kindle upon you. You'll pass through all these things, and Israel did, and we do as well, and yet God's promise is firm. I'll be with you. I'll be right there beside you. He, go, he tells us not to fear because he goes through the trials with us. He is our shepherd. He, did, he didn't say, I'll see you on the other side of uh, the valley of the shadow of death, but I'll be with you through that valley. 
I read or found this somewhere that at the end of 2013, um, that uh, some study highlighted the top 10 verses that people shared on uh, on the internet. However, they might you know maybe Facebook or however they shared it. But the top 10 verses. And we are looking at Isaiah 41 in verse 10, and according to that study, that was the third most shared verse in that, in that year, where he tells us, don't be afraid. It's in, that, that verse has inspired a lot of our hymns, how firm a foundation, guide me, O thou great Jehovah, just a closer walk uh, with thee. Also here, look at 41.13 of Isaiah. He says, For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand, who say to you, Fear not, I help you. That's inspired a lot of hymns as well. That's repeating that same thought. Uh, the precious Lord, take my hand. That's what's inspired by that verse, I'm told. So we're, what we're going to do this morning for a few minutes is focus on verse 10 of Isaiah 41. But we don't want just to pull a verse out we have to look at the verses that are surrounding this. So we're going to go through the context, but we're going to focus on that, on that verse. In Isaiah 41, and really in a couple of chapters that follow after this, the Lord is contending with the nations and he's showing he's sovereign over all human events. And as we said last week, Isaiah 40 begins almost a new section in Isaiah. Chapters 1 through 39 are usually entitled... Uh, judgment and then 40 chapter 40 through 66 hope so you have a contrast that's there god is sovereign over everything and he said he's telling his people i'm sovereign i'm going to you're you're going into babylonian slavery but i'll be with you there but i'm going to work in all that and i'm going to raise up and this is prophecy this so many years before this happens I'm going to raise up someone and he's going to conquer the Babylonians and he's going to allow you to return to your home. And that person in history is Cyrus or Cyrus the Great. And so that's prophesied so many years before even Cyrus uh, is born and, and is raised up. And that's why a lot of people who don't believe in the inspiration of Scripture say, this can't be. This is something that's written after that happened. And yet, Isaiah is inspired by God, and he's prophesying. God's working through all this. I'm going to raise up Cyrus. So go back to 41, and let's begin there real quick as we work through this. He tells the nations in verse 1, uh, really 1 through 4, the nations are invited to a discussion in the presence of God. And what he's going to do is he's going to show he's more powerful than any nation, than anyone. You keep silent before me, he says. It's almost like a courtroom. God's bringing this pe these people in, and he's saying, okay, I'm going to present the case. You present your case. What, what, what do you have? In verse 2, he says, who, uh, uh, he's talking about himself, he's raised up one from the east. That one from the east, look at verse, uh, verse 10. Oh, I'm sorry. Look at uh, on down, verse 25. Really hope that's the verse. I think it is. Um, he says, yeah, I have roused up, I woke up one from the north. That's the same one. That's the same person from the east and from the north. And really what he, he's talking about Cyrus and he's uh, Persia, king of, Cyrus, king of Persia, and Persia was northeast to Palestine and to Babylon. So back in verse 2, I've raised up this one from the east, really northeast, from verse 25, and he is going to deliver you in a sense. Now later in the coming chapters, he's going to talk about the servant, the servant of the Lord. And again, I don't want to get into that too much now, but Israel, the nation, is God's servant. Cyrus is God's servant. And then there is a servant who will suffer for the people, suffer for us in Isaiah 53, and provide atonement for us, and that's Christ. So you have this theme of the servant. Well, Cyrus is God's servant, in a sense, and he's going to deliver the people. 
Uh, so verse 2, I think, is talking about, uh, as some commentators even say, it's unquestionable that it's talking about Cyrus there, that God's raising him up. And who is this God? Well, he is the God who has done it, verse 4. He is the, from, from, he's called generations from the beginning. He's, I am the first and with the last. I, I'm the same. He's the God of history. He operates in history. He's in complete control of history. And the island saw and they feared, and they want to now deal with this one, this Cyrus is coming. So here's what they do. Verse 6, look. They say to one another, be of good courage, be strong. And so what do they do? Who do they turn? What do they turn to? Verse 7. The carpenter encouraged the goldsmith and the one that smooths with the hammer, the one that strikes the anvil, and saying, It's good, it's all good. And the one who fastens with nail, what it's talking about is they're building these idols and they're saying, it's good, they'll protect us. But God's going to come in judgment and then in verse 8, he's ta he tells his people, I'll protect you. These idols, he calls these idols. Can you speak? Can you tell me about history? Can you? Are you over history? And the answer has to be, has to be no. Uh, if you skip down to verses 21 through 24, he calls on them to set forth their case, to speak their defense. Give, give you strong reasons is the idea in the Hebrew. He challenges them to show their ability, to show the beginning and the, and the end. And then he addresses, verse 23, the idols directly. He says, tell us the things that are still to come so that we may know that you are gods. Indeed, do good or do evil so that we can be dismayed and just do anything, do anything, but they can't do anything because idols can't do anything. They're made out of wood. They're made out of uh, metal. They can't. They can't do anything. And so in verse twenty-four, he says, "Okay, well, here's really what it is. You're worthless. Your works are useless. And whoever chooses you to be their god is detestable." Now, verses 10 through 14, that begins that verse that Jimmy read there. In verse 10, God gives assurance to his people. And it's his sustaining presence throughout all of this. Because the Lord is our God, we're not filled with panic. He tells the people, I'll defend you. Verse uh, 11, he says, all that are incensed or burning against you will be ashamed and confounded. They'll be as nothing. They'll, they'll perish. Verse 12, you'll seek them and you won't find them. They warred against you, but they'll be as nothing. And the reason, verse 13, because I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand, who say to you, don't fear, I, I am helping you. I'm your redeemer, is what he says. And in verse 14, don't fear. And he calls Jacob a worm. Don't, and that's emphasizing the strength that we have to overcome fear is not in ourselves. In a sense, we're worms. Now, that's probably not to um, something that you would say, uh, okay, well, I feel good about being called a worm. But the idea is that is to encourage humility in us as we stand before God. He delivers us, and he delivers us because he is so great, not because we're, we're so great. He, in verses 15 and 16, God's people are described as new and sharp threshing instruments. It's time to, to mow down the grain, and you're going to thresh that, and it's not some dull instrument, some dull tool. It's something that's sharp and new, and God is behind all of that. <coughs> Verses 17 through 19, he says, I'll be with you. Uh, the poor are, are those who are afflicted, the needy. They seek water. They're parched. Their tongues are parched, and they don't find any. But God says, I will answer. Verse 18, he says, I'll sustain you in the wilderness. And by wilderness here, um, it means a place where there's really no water and yet God's going to give water and he's going in verse 18 and 19 to transform that wilderness into paradise 
It, you just imagine a wilderness in your mind, just a desert in your mind, and all of a sudden it's just this paradise park with streams coming down, water coming down. And I think that theologically is tied in with when all things are made new by God. This present heaven and earth will be burned up, destroyed. And I don't understand how all that's going to work out, but um, God will make all things new. And I think there is a theological theme of a return to Eden. No tears, no sorrow, no death. God's bringing all things new. Now, the nations around Israel can see the writing on the wall. They know that this is going to happen. And they're scrambling for a solution. As I said, they're trying to get their idols all ready for that. And so, in the middle of all of that, God says to his people, don't be afraid. Don't fear. I'll uphold you in these troubling times. And so, let's go back now to verse 10. And I want to focus a little bit on this. And I've had a little bit of help uh, in, in various works in looking at the way that this is structured that was very helpful to me. So, um, I mean, you need to know this. Uh, probably the majority of what I talk about doesn't come right out of my head. Uh, there, are some other, there are some smart people out there that I, you know, look at those and read those and read books. And um, it, it helps us as we understand the flow of God's Word. So, verse 10 is the command, is the verse that was read. Don't fear, he says. That, that's the command. And also the command there is, don't be dismayed. Don't turn around and, and gaze away. Don't fear, don't anxiously look away, as one translation puts it. And as always in the Bible, there are reasons for a command. Commands don't just hang in the air by themselves. If God commands us to do something, there are good reasons for that. And so here are the reasons, and there are five of these from this verse. Don't fear, for I'm with you. That's the first one. As one person put it, these are like if you have a, a, a something, you have pillars that support it. So here's the pillar that supports do not fear. It's I'm with you. A second pillar is I am your God. This is from verse 10. Don't look anxiously about you because I'm your God. The third pillar is, I will strengthen you. Don't fear, I will strengthen you. The fourth pillar is, surely I will help you. And then the fifth is, surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So to restate that, those five pillars that, that support the command, don't fear, God's with me. God is my God, God will strengthen me, God will help me, and God will uphold me. Now, how many times do you need to be told that? Well, over, it, it, the, saying that over and over and over is really underscoring this. God is with us, so don't fear. When God calls you to be fee, free from fear in some situation in life, maybe you're called to courageously stand for Him, Maybe you're facing some test in life. Maybe you have to stand against some unjust practice in those that are around you. Maybe even when you leave a secure position for something that doesn't seem so secure. But you want to focus on the kingdom. You want to focus on God. Maybe when you face an operation. Maybe when you face a treatment. When you're facing the death of of someone close to you. When God calls you to be free from fear, this is, this is supported by these pillars here. When he says, I will be with you. Fear not. God's with you. Fear not. God is your God. Fear not. God will strengthen you. Fear not. God will, will help you. And fear not. God will uphold you. And so the key to overcoming fear is resting on those pillars. That's foundational. Now, if, if those pillars are the foundation of don't fear, then God's person and his character support those. Because notice they're all focused on God. Well, who is God? As we work through many of these verses here, look at the glimpses that it gives us. 
it gives us a picture of God as the judge of all the earth. We saw that verse 1. He calls the coastlands or the islands. He says, let the peoples gain strength. It's God calling all people because God is the judge of all people. The God who's God who is judge of all people is the God who supports you and says, don't fear. That's the God who will strengthen you. Verses 2 and 3 that we talked about, that he's raising up Cyrus. And notice what he says there. Uh, he's raised up one from the east at whose steps victory is, is attending. He gives nations before him. That's that one from the east, that's Cyrus. And makes him, that's Cyrus, rule over kings. His sword makes them as dust, his bow as the, the stubble. He pursues them. He passes on safely. The way with his feet he does not tread. The idea is that his, his, he has victory and God is with him and his victorious march is so much, is so vivid that it's almost like his feet don't touch the ground in, in the Hebrew here. And so this second principle is God is the ruler of all rulers. He raised up Cyrus and he's giving him that strength. That's, that's who God is who's supporting that pillar of do not fear. Then look at verse 4. Who is God? He's the uncreated first. He is the Lord. Who's performed this, he said? Who's done this? What's the one who calls generations from the beginning? I, the Lord, who am the first and with the last, am the same. He is the Lord, Lord Yahweh. That he's the one who always exists, and he is the one who is in control over all of history. He strengthens and helps us. And then look at verses 5 through 7. He is the God who chose his people. The island saw, they feared, the ends of the earth trembled, and they're trying to, you know, build these idols so we can stand. But then God says, verse 8, You, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I've chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. God chose his people. So be strong, he says. Your strength is not in some idol that you can craft together with wood or nails and, or metal. Your strength is in God who chose you as, as his people. He chose Abraham and you're a descendant of him and Abraham is his friend. And really that's what God has done for us. He's chose us in Christ as we respond to him in Christ. Now all of those things intensify the pillars that we were talking about that supports that we're not to fear. The God who judges all the earth and calls the world to give account, the God who rules history, the God who calls the nations because he's the first and the last, the God who calls his people and makes himself their God freely and graciously is the same God who says, I am your God, I'm with you, I'll strengthen you, I'll help you, I'll uphold you. Then comes the command, therefore, because I'm the judge of all the nations, therefore, because I'm ruler of all the rulers, because I call nations into being, because I chose you freely, because I'm the great sovereign God, I'm your God, I'm with you, I'll strengthen you, I'll help you, I'll uphold you, therefore, don't fear. That's, that's the power of this. The factor in not fearing is not dependent upon you, in a sense, relying on your own strength. God is over us. He sends His Spirit in us. We are to live for Christ. It's all foundational on who God is. Therefore, don't fear. Don't fear. We need to stop defining who we are by our past or even our, our future. We define who we are in our relationship to God and, and through Christ. Now, this verse 10 is a, is a specific promise to a specific people at a specific time. And those people are Israel. It comes out of this book, Isaiah. So is it right for modern day Christians to take this, one of the most popular verses that we said, to take this and 
build a whole sermon on it or and to encourage each other not to fear if it's written to Israel. Well, it does have a specific context. Yet, in a sense, we and that's the power of God's Word. So you can't just pull something out and make it mean anything you want to mean, but this is based upon who God is. He upheld Israel, and He upholds us. And that's why it's here. The Lord is with His people. The Lord is our God. He'll strengthen us. He still st stands for us. So perhaps in, in some way, this truth, don't fear, because God is our God, will be very powerful to you and powerful to me as we face unknowns, as we face the, the future. Now, when God tells us, I'm with you as a, as a Christian, we have His Holy Spirit in us. We have His powerful Word. We have Christ. So, don't fear. It's grounded on who God is. Art has announced uh, an invitation song, number 50. I can't think of what the song is now. I saw it a minute ago, not probably 20 minutes ago, and I forgot. But um, we're going to sing that. If you're not a Christian, then uh, we could turn this whole thing around. You, you need to fear. You don't have a foundation to stand upon. If you are, are not related to God through His dear Son who, who died for us, um, then the future is, is bleak for you. It's, un, it's unknown. And so we call you this morning, if you're not a Christian, to make a decision. You're going to put your trust in, in Christ, in God, as you turn away from sin, confess your sins, confess your trust in Him, and you're immersed. If you've done that and you are not trusting in Him and you need the help, you need the prayers and encouragement of fellow Christians, uh, it's our prayer that if you need that, you'll, you'll come as we stand and sing this song.